Hello, I'm Andrew Palmley. I'm the organist of St James Golinghythe, and I also uh, am the alderman for the ward. I've been associated with this parish and this ward for the best part of 30 years. Uh, when the previous rector decided that he thought it was a good idea to have some bells, it fell to me to raise the money for the bells. Uh, no mean task in times of recession, but in fact, this turned out to be one of the easiest fundraising uh, jobs I've ever undertaken because we decided we were going to launch our bell appeal to coincide with the Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. The net result being that each of our wonderful eight bells uh, bears the royal crest and people were very, very keen indeed to be associated with these royal bells. The Royal Jubilee Bells were cast at the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in January and February 2012. To cast a bell, you have to make a mould. The people at the foundry start off by making the inside of a mould, which is laced with brick, and then it's covered in a material called loam, which is a combination of clay, sand, goat hair, and, of all things, horse manure. But it's, it's a great material because when it hardens, it's hard enough for you to pour molten bronze on it without affecting it. The moulds are made in two parts. The bottom part, which is called the core, and the part at the top, called the cope. And when you put core and cope together, they lock together, and the gap between the two is actually the gap, which is the bell. That happened on a Friday. They're then allowed to cool over the weekend, and when Monday morning arrives, then they can start taking the two parts of the mould apart and breaking out the bell from the remains of the hardened loam around it. Before we could complete putting the bells in the tower, actually there was already a tenant up here. I say a tenant. In 1855, a very well-preserved mummy was discovered under the floor of the church, and it's been stored in the church ever since then. Nobody knows who it is, but it's certainly a gentleman who would appear to be in his mid-40s in age, remarkably well-preserved, Nobody knows anything about him. His ear was pierced. He was therefore probably uh, a sailor. He probably worked on the garlic hive, and uh, there's reason to believe he may well have been Italian. But other than that, we know nothing about this person. For the best part of the last decade, he's been at rest in a coffin up in what is now the Belfry. Very affectionately, he's been given the name Jimmy Garlic. So, one of the things the Whitechapel Bell family did when lifting the bells up was to very reverently take Jimmy out of his coffin to lower the body of the mummy and his coffin down to the ground. And he's since been taken to a room under the church where, after a few prayers from the parish priest, um, he will now lay in rest. Once the bell is cleaned up, the next thing to do is to tune it. Because a bell actually makes more than one note, um, there are five different notes within a bell that are specifically tuned. And by tuning a bell, what you're doing is you're taking metal out of the inside of the bell. 
And to do that, they turn it upside down and put it on what is effectively a giant lathe. And depending on where you take the metal out, will affect where the notes will change. And so the tuner, and this is a very specialist task, knows where to take metal out to affect the notes until all five notes come into order. There's the main note, there's an octave above, an octave below, but there's also a third, a minor third, and a fifth. And if you get those together, it sounds a bit like a chord. And a really well-tuned bell has all of those notes exactly right to the nearest hertz almost. When the bell has been tuned, the, the top of the bell is drilled with a hole, and then that means they can put the headstock on. That's basically the yoke, the, the bit that holds the bell together, onto the bearings and the gudgeons where it can sit on the frame. My name is David Robson. I work for JCC Engineering. I'm the project manager on the, um, the pageant bell frame. It's a big Meccano set, basically. It's a 6.8 tonne structure. Um, with Once the floor's been fitted um, and the bells, it goes around about 11 tonnes. There's been a pageant before, uh, I believe about 350 years ago, um, but this is going to be a first for bells to be rung on the River Thames, which is great, and it's great to be a part of it. Once the bells have been peeled by Dickon and his, and his uh, bell ringers, um, the bells will be taken off the structure, and the structure will be broken down into pieces again and loaded onto, loaded onto a lorry. Um, it will be then transported to Denton Wharf, uh, Gravesend in Kent, and where it will be reassembled, bells be put back in, flooring back in, and the whole structure will be lifted into the barge. I'm Martin Streeter, the production manager for the uh, pageant for the Queen on the Thames. Um, I'm working with a guy called Jonathan Bartlett, um, who's employed me to put the, uh, the structure you see over there onto the barge uh, with the bells in it. And it'll be going down the Thames um, first for rehearsal on Saturday uh, and then on the third on the day. the Ursula Catherine um, and the boat that's pushing it uh, is the tug called the Stephen B um, and in this case we're going to be pushing it down from behind um, which I believe is a little unusual but they've got more control over the whole craft it sort of becomes one boat it's not just uh, it's not just a tug pulling a barge uh, and because they weren't um, controlling it through the bridges and stuff uh, it's a bit easier to push it um, than pull it as far as the Belfry is concerned, there's a uh, company called Steel the Sea um, have organised it and uh, project managed building it uh, and getting all the steel work done with another company called JCC. 
who have actually made all the steel work that the bells will hang on. Uh, one of my concerns with the barge is ballasting it down. Um, obviously we've got a height restriction to get under the bridges uh, and the PLA have given us a height of 5.3 metres that we have to be in uh, to get under the bridges. Um, so what we have to do, the barge is sitting pretty high at the minute and we've got to put about 140 tonnes of ballast into the barge so that we can get an air draft uh, down to about 2.2. And if all that works out and the height of the belfry works out and the bells, um, we should be coming in at 5.3, which is exactly right for the going under the bridges. The idea for bells on the barge, and as part of the pageant, came from the pageant master, Adrian Evans. Um, how to do it was a combination of the bell founder and myself, where we worked out feasibly how it could be made to work what the tower would need to look like, how the bells would be hung. These are large bells. Together there are about two or three tons worth of bell metal swinging around. There are big forces. But we realised it was possible and the only way to work out whether it was really going to work as effectively as we thought it might was to do it. Now when I say control, when we ring the bells, we ring from the position where the bell is face up and we rotate it through 360 degrees until it's face up again and then back the other way. And what we have to do as ringers is to control the point where it pauses and that's where we have to put it at the balance. In a tower like this, that's fairly straightforward and that's what you learn to do. When you're on a boat, you find that you think you're giving the bell enough momentum to take it to the balance where you expect it to be, and then if the boat pushes it, then you have to balance that extra momentum given by the wash, for example, to either pull it, pull it harder to make sure it goes up to the balance point, or indeed to check it, because what you don't want is the bell to fly past the balance point and then you end up breaking something. So each time you ha we had to keep our ropes very taut just so that we could feel where that balance point was and counteract the rest of the movement of the boat. On the boat the bells didn't sound as loud as they did in the warehouse because we didn't have walls around the bells reflecting all the sound. So we were able to shout at each other and shout instructions more effectively which was very handy. My original plan was to actually call everything by using a whistle. But in, in the end I didn't need to use a whistle because by shouting loudly enough I was able to make myself heard. On the day of the pageant it rained. 
um, a bit disappointing. It wasn't too bad. It was a, a light rain to start with, and then when we went past Tower Bridge, it absolutely pelted down. But we rang the bells for the pageant. We rang a quarter peal. We started at the Albert Bridge, and we carried on ringing all the way down to Greenwich. The largest bell uh, was purchased for us by the Worshipful Company of Vintners. And that's a particularly appropriate thing as they are uh, the major livery company in the ward of Vintry. The second uh, largest bell was in the end donated by the Worshipful Company of Dyers. And the interesting thing about the Vintners and the Dyers is of course that they are the two uh, livery companies with the ancient rights to go swan upping along with the Queen, so another royal connection there. The third bell uh, was donated collectively by the members of the Worshipful Company of Glass Cellars. The fourth bell is the parish bell donated by members of our own community. Next comes the Bettinson bell named after Charles Bettinson, a young member of the Worshipful Company of Horners who raised uh, the money single-handedly including uh, by a sponsored climber Mont Blanc. The Crace bell was donated by parishioner uh, Joanna Warrand uh, and she is a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Painters and Stainers. And the next bell donated by past master uh, joiner, past master of the Joiners and Sealers Company, Tony Stockwell, another long-standing and very supportive member of this parish. The small bell uh, was donated by the Worshipful Company of, of Musicians, of which I happen to be the master, uh, and was jointly purchased by the Musicians Company and good friends of the church, Tony and Effie Casimiotis, uh, who wanted to uh, include their daughter's name on it. So it bears the name both of the musicians and of Prince Henry and of Nicole Marie Casimiotis. When the Bishop of the former Bishop of Chelmsford, uh, dedicated the bells. He described them as the most heard and most seen bells in the history of the universe. And no doubt he's right, because not only were these bells uh, first seen in the River Pageant on the 3rd of June, in the Herald Barge before the Queen's Adam Jubilee Pageant, uh, but of course they were watched by countless millions of viewers on television screens across the globe. Now let me tell you a little bit about St James Garlic High. This is one of the Wren churches which was built after the Great Fire of London. Uh, it's a particularly fine building with a very high nave. In fact, it's got the second highest nave after St Paul's Cathedral. And as a result of an extra row of windows high up in the, in the walls, it's known as Wren's Lantern. It contains a number of interesting features. We have, for example, uh, the, the pulpit and choir stalls from St Michael's Queen Hythe, uh, the pulpit bearing a wig peg. We have uh, the Geddes painting of the Ascension. Either side of the altar in the sanctuary, we have small credence tables, which were made out of pieces of the Marchioness after she sank in that tragic accident uh, in the Thames, which happened to be in the parish. At the back of the church, we have a very fine organ, which was restored some years ago, originally built by Father Smith, we think, we think uh, and uh, restored with the help of the Heritage Lottery Fund recently. But our uh, pièce de résistance at the moment uh, are our new uh, peel of eight bells.
right. Okay. And all your blue bells. Look to Charles going and she's stopped. <laughs> I'd particularly like to thank the many members of the congregation of St James Garlic Hyde who each individually uh, wished to be associated with the project and gave a considerable sums of money which will be commemorated in a series of brass plaques which will put one set of plaques uh, up in the uh, ringing chamber and another one inside the church so that forevermore any visitors to St James Garlic Hyde will be able to appreciate the vast generosity of the members of the congregation of this very point. And the thing about bells, you know, is that they're not just around for 50 years or 100 years. There's no reason why these bells will not sound out for the next 500 years. <laughs>